Um, all right, well, thank you all for joining uh, us for this panel. Panel. Um, my name is Deli Wilkins, um, and I am the Endowments uh, Program Analyst, so the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, which you might have heard about if you were on the previous uh, presentation. So uh, my background is in agriculture first. Um, I was raised on a dairy goat farm in the mountains of Southwest Virginia. Um, after college, I had the wonderful privilege of joining uh, the United States Peace Corps, where I worked as an agricultural extensionist uh, in rural Paraguay, uh, where I was introduced to the concept of agroforestry. Um, so after that, I got my master's in agroforestry from Virginia Tech um, and have worked in, in agriculture or forestry or both um, since. So. If you joined the previous presentation, you heard me talk about the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, um, and you also heard me talk about their role in the Sustainable Forestry and African-American Land Retention Network. Um, so in this panel um, here, we will hear from a small but very critical uh, sample of individuals who were involved in this e effort and who are involved in forestry uh, more broadly. Um, and as I alluded to previously, um, collaboration is really the key to the success of programs like this. Um, it includes collaboration among different agencies and organizations, as you'll hear about when uh, Amadou and Arjun speak. Um, it includes collaboration with um, among different universities and states, um, as you'll hear about likely from Sam. Um, it includes collaboration with, with fellow farmers, community members, um, or even the network itself, um, as you'll likely hear about when Kedron speaks. So I, I just wanna thank the larger SFLR network. We've talked about them a lot today. Um, in particular, the SFLR leadership team as well um, for allowing the endowment um, to support the program for so many years. Um, I'm a kind of a recent addition to the team, but have really enjoyed learning from, from each site, um, from each person really that I talked to. And I want to uh, thank our panelists for joining today to share their experiences. Um, I'll introduce them all in a minute not just with, with SFLR, but again, their broader experience in forestry. Um, so as we all know, agriculture and forestry are, are critical to our nation. Um, they supply our food and our household products that we use every day. Um, and we are constantly learning from our fields, learning from our soil, our stand of trees, what have you. Um, and we're learning from each other too. So um, the amount of combined knowledge um, in this panel uh, is pretty amazing. So I'm mostly going to go ahead and let them speak. Um, for our lineup, we'll have Amadou Diop with the U.S. Forest Service, um, and then Sam Cook with NC State, uh, then Kedron Dillard with Shipley Associates and a forest landowner, um, and finally Arjun Dur with the American Forest Foundation. So uh, each person will present on their topic, uh, share their screen if they have a presentation to give, and then we'll do kind of a Q&A session. So at any point during any presentation, uh, just post your questions in the Q&A box and we will try to answer as many live as possible. So first we have Amadou Diop. I'm so glad you're here. You know, when we spoke of critical keys to the success of SFLR, uh, the endowment would be remiss if we didn't emphasize uh, just how crit critical you were, Amadou, and the, and the Forest Service were to that program, um, and even more broadly, uh, how critical you are to the success of our forests all throughout the U.S. Um, so without further ado, Amadou, um, you're an outreach liaison for the U.S. Forest Service, um, so I will let you go ahead and, and speak and present if you if you have a topic. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I want to congratulate Manoe Oga for its fourth Hispanic Farmers and Agricultural Professional Symposium. I am really honored to be here, and I'm really humbled to sit on this panel with some of my colleagues. Uh, I want to share some information today uh, about the Forest Service, uh, some of the work that the state and private forestry is doing, and also just touch a little bit on SFLR. I know that we have a very diverse audience today, so I want to start by briefly introducing the Forest Service. Uh, the mission of the Forest Service is to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of the nation's forests and grasslands to meet the needs of present and future generations. The Forest Service provides leadership in the protection, management, and use of the nation's forest. Our motto of caring for the land 
and serving people has not changed, but, have, but our work has evolved. We are more in a very interconnected and interdependent landscape. And we know and believe that we should share resources and find ways to bring diverse partners together to tackle the many challenges and issues we face. We believe that when we share stewardship, we can leverage our collective resources to accomplish better result and outcome that benefits all of us. The Forest Service manages over 191 million acres of land. There are nine regions in the Forest Service, and these regions are numbered 1 to 10. I work out of Region 8, which is the southern region, which extends from Virginia to Florida and west to Texas, and include Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Major division of the agency include the chief's office, the national forest system, which manage uh, the, the, the national forest, business operation, research and development, and state and private forestry. The goal of the state and private forestry program is to assist with financial and technical assistance to private landowners, state agencies, tribes, and community resource management. We work very closely with non-federal entities, as I said, such as private landowners, state organizations, including state forestry agencies, tribal government, and other that have land under their responsibility and authority. Who own American forests? We talked about this throughout the day today, but out of the 151 million acres of forest land in the US, 56% of that is privately owned. And that represents over 10 million private land owners. The majority of the private forest land, as you can see, I'm not sure you can see my slide right now, but it's concentrated in the Eastern part of the United States. The remaining 44% of publicly owned land is managed by federal government, state forestry, parks, wildlife agencies, and local government. 62% of the private forest land uh, of the private forest land is owned by families and individuals. So it's very interesting when you look at the US Forest Service Woodland Owners Survey. In terms of acreages, the majority of the forest land is in holdings of 100 acres or more. Also, 61% of the family forest land own is in holdings of less than 10 acres. So basically the majority of the forest land is controlled by landowners that own 10 acres or less. So our private, our cooperative forestry program outreach program targeted limited resources, minority and socially disadvantaged individuals. Through our work, we ensure and facilitate access to USDA programs and services. And a lot of these programs are managed by agencies like NRCS, the Forest Service, FSA, and other agencies under USDA. We also establish, stimulate, and maintain partnership with diverse organizations to serve underserved landowners. So again, we talked a lot about uh, uh, how we can engage partnership to leverage our resources to be able to address some of the some of the challenges we face in terms of forestry, but also engage the majority of uh, the, uh, the forest land owners community. To uh, our program, basically, we seek to increase awareness and access of USD program. We also promote sustainable forestry. We also provide information and technical assistance to increase ecological and economic values of the land and enhance benefit for landowners. 
we finally help family retain their land ownership. We are involved in providing financial resources to our partners and state forestry agencies for direct funding. So we do stand along grant and agreement with partners. Uh, we also do work very closely with state forestry agencies that implement most of our most of the forest service program and an example of program that is administered by state forestry agencies is the forest stewardship program through which private land owners can get management grant we also facilitate outreach education and demonstration activities through our partners and directory As I said earlier, we partner with many organizations and agencies, the state forestry agencies, many conservation organizations like the American Forest Foundation, the US Endowment for Forestry Communities. We do partner with the forest industry, universities, and particularly land grant institutions when it comes to working with underserved communities and many nonprofit organizations and community based organizations. Uh, we have many examples of partnership, and one of them that's going to be talked about today is the Sustainable Forestry and African American Land Retention Program, known as SFLR. We also do some work around agroforestry, partnering with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, and you know the Hispanic Landowners Enumeration Study is a partnership between the U.S. Endowment and Mano Iora, but that partnership is primarily funded by the US Forest Service. So I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about the Sustainable Forestry and Land Retention Program. The program began in 2013 as the partnership between the USDA and RCS, the Forest Service, and the US Endowment for Forestry and Communities. This was a comprehensive effort to address long-standing issues that African-American landowners were facing throughout the Southeast through their under-participation in forest management and government-sponsored program. Uh, they are also having a lot of issues in terms of property ownership, land loss, and one of the issue was heirs property. And the lack of return from their land management practices. They were receiving little or no economic return from their land. So the overall purpose of the program was to use sustainable forestry to inspire African Americans to address land ownership issues and derive benefit from their land. Throughout the process and since 2013, Many other partners joined the initiative, such as the Mary Reynolds Babcock Foundation, the GPB Foundation, and currently the initiative is managed through the American Forest Foundation, who's uh, playing a leadership role in working with the SFLR network. So the objective of the program was to stem African American land loss while increasing for forest profit profitability and assess value, uh, complement USDA outreach and forestry program, increase access to USDA program, and finally develop a sustainable network of support. So the initiative was uh, built under the foundation of SFLR anchor organization. And these are uh, nonprofit organization, community-based organization, grassroots organization, established in this state that really implemented the program because of uh, their trusted relationship with their communities. So currently the program is being implemented in Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and Texas. And these are the organizations that are managing this proje project in their respective state. So, Again, thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to the Q&A session. 
thank you so much, Amadou. That uh, was a wonderful overview of, of both the Forest Service and, and the SFLR network. Um, Sam, I believe you are up next if you are around. Um, for those that do not know Sam Cook, um, he wears many, many, many hats um, and he wears them all very well. Uh, he serves as the executive director of uh, Forest Assets for the North Carolina State University College of Natural Resources. Um, he's the vice president of the Natural Resources Foundation. Um, he co-manages the Forester of the Future program, uh, which is a partnership between the College of Nat Natural Resources, Tuskegee, uh, and Resource Management Services. It offers uh, acceler accelerated graduate degree degree programs to students from underrepresented groups uh, interested in pursuing forestry careers, um, among many, many other things. So Sam, um, if you would like to uh, speak or give a presentation, if you have one, um, you are welcome to do so now. Thank you. Thank you, Nola, for that fine introduction. And thank you, Nola, for allowing us, allowing me to participate and present to this wonderful group. Thanks to the audience, I was able to start uh, at one o'clock listening and the students did a fantastic job with the Q&A session and describing the work that they do. I'm very passionate about students, as you can tell from the bio that Nelly just read, but I'm more I'm also passionate about the minority landowners and the impact that we have been able to do since around 2012, 2013. I would be remiss not to talk a little bit about our university because I feel like what you are getting ready to undertake has a lot to do with the land grant universities and the work that you need to engage them with as you do the work going forward. Here at NC State, we have a mission as a research extensive land grant university. We're dedicated to excellent teaching, the creation, application of knowledge, and engagement with public and private partners. You heard Dr. Amadou talk about all that in his presentation, and a lot of the information that I will share with you kind of relates to what he presented from the Forest Service side of the business and the partnerships that are necessary for you to move forward in this work as it relates to the Hispanic Land on the Partnership. We are have a strength in science and technology with a commitment to excellence in a, in a comprehensive range of disciplines. We promote an integrated approach to problem solving and transform lives and provides leadership for social, economic, and tech technological technology development across our NC world and around the world. So we not only work in North Carolina, but we work globally. We have a tagline that we present all the time, which is think and do. So we encourage our faculty, our staff, and our students to always keep that in the forefront of their minds because as we move forward, we wanna help solve problems that are important. And my focus, as Delhi stated, I'm in the College of Natural Resources, which leads back to who I am as a forester. I came to NC State by way of Tuskegee University from 1979 up to 1982. Finished my degree at NC State in forestry in 1985. So I've been in the landowner community for a long time. I started with the Forest Service on the West Coast with the Intermountain Forest and Range Experimental Station. I came back to North Carolina and spent my time with a company called Duke Energy, which also helped me to identify with landowners, not just in rural, but in cities and urban settings. I put 17 years with International Paper Company where I was in the supply chain side of the business. That work allowed me to understand more about landowners as it relates to purchasing land, purchasing timber, building on land on a programs within, the, within that particular company. But most importantly, I ran a manufacturing company for three years and I retired from them very early. But I'll give you a secret. I did all that work and did not realize that air property existed until I came to the Center for Air's Property Preservation. If you notice in one of Amadou's present uh, slides, the center was one of the SFLR project sites. I was initiated first to be part of the design team with the endowment to help build out the pilot study. And we had three, two in Alabama. We had three states with four particular nonprofits. Two were in Alabama, one was in South Carolina and the other was in North Carolina. So we ran that program as a pilot study up until around 2013, 14, I would say 14 or 15. And the endowment was able to say that this is an important program that we want to expand, but to continue to see it 
move forward. And I've been fortunate enough to work in the South, in all 13 Southern states along my career to see the impact of what can be done as relates to working with minority landowners. When we developed the program, we had to think about how we wanted to move forward. And we created a tool that we didn't know the name, but we assumed the name was called an asset map, which allowed us to lay out the number of partners that we need to interface with before we take this out on the ground to work with the landowners. So we listed those partners and said, we need in our CS, FSA, we need to deal with universities, whether it's the historically black universities or the predominantly white institutions. We also needed to deal with people that do surveying, uh, appraisals, uh, people that got into the consultant business to do to help our landowners in timber sales and contract preparation. We needed to have loggers involved in the business. We also needed to have attorneys that can help with the air property issues. Fortunate, the center and the pilot area I was working with in South Carolina, they, hired, they had the air property program for about 10 years when I came into the program with them in 2013, that allowed them that they paid the attorneys to actually do the resolution work with the landowners that was brought into the program. That to me was a, a successful outcome because we were able to show landowners that if you clear title or you at least help on the resolution side of the title, it would expand your ability to get your land from an asset, I mean, from a liability to an asset. I'll share a story with you. I had one landowner, which was made up of four sisters. The four sisters owned 267 acres of land. They came to me one day after someone as a wood buyer approached them to buy the light timber off of that 267 acres. They were offered $90,000 the first round. One week later, the same group, just a different person, came back and offered 190. So one of the ladies who heard me speak to the church in an outreach effort, she called me and she says, I'd like to talk to you. I said, what do you want to talk about? She said, I've been made these offers and I heard you say something in the church that told me, don't take the first deal and do not take, do not accept something that someone's trying to make you move quickly. I said, good. I said, do you have time for us to visit? She says, yeah. She came to see me first. We sat around the table. She described to me everything that she had. I said, well, let me bring one of my consultant partners back to visit with you. Because one of the things I made a point on as I'm building the program in South Carolina is for, not, for me not to wear my forestry hat. Our goal was to make sure every landowner knew exactly of all the natural resource professionals that can help them, including the Forest Service, whether it's state or private or in the feds. The end game with them was 30 days later, after sitting around the table with all four sisters, we were able to convince them to sign a contract to allow us to show them that there's more value than what you were offered in the first and second round. We intent, we finally made a deal and they had an offer of $430,000. Now, they were ready to take the 30, I mean the 90, and they also was real ready to take the 190. But when we got them to 30, we introduced them to um, the person that was buying the timber, which was a mill. The mill had to do a uh, title search Come to find out they did not have clear title. They found a young kid who was represented as an owner over in China, but it took them a while to find that individual. They had to post it on Facebook, took 45 days to locate, and we finally were able to help them solve the title issue. Now, if they were not a client of the center at that time, they would have lost the $430,000 because the bid would have been rejected and they probably would have moved down to the 190. So when I say this, it helped the landowner retain the land, retain the money and achieve clear title so they can make better decisions in the future. We didn't stop there. We introduced them to USDA and the Natural Resource Conservation Services, which meant they can apply for conservation items on the land. When we did that, we were able to gain, after putting them through 
NRCS, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, close to $160,000 back to help them in reforestation and growing new trees. Now I back up a moment. The four sisters had kids. Those kids would not take the time to come down and visit with us when we sat around the table to talk about the land ownership piece and how we're gonna help the family structure to get money out of the land. Once we were able to show them or get that $407,000 check, they start calling, they wanted to meet. But beyond that, we showed them after planting these trees and doing the right genetics underground, that there's potential for additional income in the future. And we project 30 years. And I showed them an estimate that you can have anywhere from 800 to a million, 800,000 to a million dollars on the next rotation. That really got their attention. The kids start bringing their children, the grandkids and others to meet with the family. And now they are fully engaged with the family managing the land and they see it as an asset versus that liability. So that story is to tell you, you can't take this slowly. You have to take it with a grain of salt to help bring people along with you. The obstacles that I heard earlier that most landowners have as it come to barriers is true. It's lack of trust, the unknown. They never had to see trees as a item of interest that they can make money from. It's always been an insurance policy for them because they can sell timber quickly to pay something as a bill, insurance, buy a car, fix a roof, you name it. But in the program, we laid out steps that we wanted to make sure every landowner went through. And that pilot required us to build a contract between us and the individual landowners that we brought in the program to study. And we did that with them for a full year and we talked about the different services that were available to them as landowners in this program. And I'll start with the first one, which was forest management planning and mapping, reforestation services, timber stand improvements, timber appraisals, timber marketing and volume of estimations, timber sales, contract preparation and administration, logging, engineering, pre-harvest planning, forest protection as it relates to insects and disease and fire, prescribed burning, additional service that we had to really bring other experts in to talk through these in the workshops that we entered into with them because we met with this every landowner who signed up in the program in the pilot which we had 40 in the center's territory is to learn about christmas tree management some environmental impacts that are associated with their land or the neighbors the real estate side of forestry all the recreational activities that they can earn income from the big ticket was forest taxation. Not many any of the landowners understood that as the reason to get into learning what real estate and taxation meant. The utilization and marketing side of the business, that's how we got the $430,000 and the other $160,000 so they can see that there's an opportunity to play in this, in this game. Herbicide recommendations application as it relates to managing land along with fire prescribed to cut down on, on disease surveying wetlands delineation, forest wildlife management, give you a secret. Most of the landowners that we interface with in the pilot study, when you talk about what are your management objectives as we get ready to write a plan, they all said we wanna manage for wildlife. It took me a while to understand why the, what was driving them toward that. Because in the world that we all grew up as African-Americans or minority landowners, the land was your savings for food. You used it to make sure you grew the crops, that you can hunt and it was your safe haven. The trees were there as a backup and we were getting pennies on the dollar when they were sold. So there was no reason for them to think about the trees as, a, as an asset going forward. But we were able to show them that they can get both. Even urban forestry, uh, a lot of our landowners that we entered into the program at the center in the first part was all around the Charleston area. Uh, in, in the rural parts of Charleston, but they still had urban trees and they were also growing within the city limits. So we had to train people on what things that they can do as it relates to urban forestry and what we can do to help them. Stewardship plans, big ticket for the Forest Service. We em embraced that with the Forest Service in the states that we operated in and making sure that they knew that these landowners wanted to participate in the stewardship pro in the program itself. 
And I give you the story so you can see the value of what a program like this is all about. Uh, I'm so passionate about the work that I continue to work with organizations, no matter what state they live in, to build out programs similar to this. I'm, I'm fortunate that the endowment was able to launch it and invite organizations throughout the communities to participate in. But this is not an or this is not an NGO one off program. The big part of this is developing the landowners to be advocates on the ground in the communities that they live in to ensure that they talk to their families, talk to other community leaders, and demonstrate and showcase what they have to offer, what they have done, what they have done on the land, and how important it is for them to bring the others into the space that we develop with them. Appreciate the time. Thank you for your uh, for listening. Thank you, Sam. That was that was wonderful. It's always great to hear uh, your perspective and your and your stories as well. Um, and I think that's actually a good transition uh, to Kedrin. Uh, if you are here, Kedrin, um, also a, a forest landowner and within the SFLR network. Um, in addition to that, um, Kendron is also an executive committee member with Shipley Associates. Um, she oversees business development, consulting, training, strategy, and partnerships uh, for Shipley, Shipley's, excuse me, Mid-Atlantic region. Um, and since 2009, has also served uh, on the board of trustees with the American Forest Foundation, which we'll hear a little bit more about as well. Um, in May of 2021, uh, Dillard testified before the U.S. Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry um, in support of the rural Forest Markets Act um, legislation that supports uh, family forest owners' access to carbon markets. Uh, so, Kedrin, if you're around and would like to make a few um, comments, that would be wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dilly. Um, it's a it's an honor and privilege uh, to speak with everyone. I'm assuming I can be heard. Um, but thank you for that kind introduction. As 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 noted, I am Kedrin Dillard. I think um, the little bit that wasn't a part of that intro is that I consider California home. I'm from California, however, currently live here in, uh, in Washington, DC. Um, as you all know, and, and probably have experienced before in many, many different uh, networking or, or, or environments, when you meet people for the first time or where you're in these uh, you know, conferences or symposiums, you're often asked two things. What do you do for a living? And tell us a bit about yourself. So as Delay uh, mentioned, uh, as far as professionally, I, I oversee sales and engagements and strategic initiatives for, for government contractors. That's what I do for Shipley. It's what I do for a living. Um, and regarding number two, when I'm asked, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I often start that answer with saying that I'm a proud fourth generation forest landowner. Um, I was asked today to share a bit about my land and my family story, a personal one. Um, and after some thought as to how I would approach this, I feel the best way to share and tell my story is to explain the journey and trajectory I've personally been on as it pertains to what my family's land has meant to me through the different and distinct and various stages of, of, of my life, my personal life. Um, I mentioned I'm from California, and more specifically, I, I graduated from, from high school uh, and uh, went to undergraduate school and, and college in Northern California. But in actuality, my father spent uh, 20 years as a pilot in the Air Force. So as a result, I really went to three different, three different high schools. Um, on average, we moved about every two years. School and friends and Little League teams and teachers changed quite often for my brothers and I given all the moves and relocations, uh, but what remained very constant in our lives is, is where we spent where we spent our summers. Um, my earliest memories were the smells from our farm. When I thought about speaking to you today uh, and the feeling of being free as a toddler, I distinctly remember that feeling of, of being free on the farm. Uh, the pigs and chickens and the cows and riding tractors and eating my grandmother's cooking and the way she smelled like dough all the time and how tight her hugs were. I remember uh, she would she would cry when we and as she would run to the car, even if it was in the middle of the night to greet us. Um, and then I also distinctly remember looking back in the car back window and she would cry heartbroken as we would as we would drive away after our visit. 
And no matter where we lived as a military family, every summer we drove to the farm, which is in, which our farm is located in Southwest Virginia, um, from California, from Michigan, from Alabama, from Texas. And this was way before iPads and, and smartphones and all the gadgets. We, we drove to the farm every summer, as, as I mentioned. Um, we had and still have over 100 acres of land, uh, 75 or so of those acres are in trees across two plots. And uh, as a toddler, I thought that land, our land and all that it encompassed was as big as the universe. Um, I meant it, it goes back to that feeling is free and particularly having very strict military parents in our household, when we went to the farm, they would just let us run and the freedom was tangible. It was awesome. Uh, so that was my lens as a toddler in my teenage years and in my twenties, the farm for my family was still a place where we all convened every summer. But by now, instead of my, uh, my immediate family, we began having these family reunions or what we coined as Jam Marie's. And that was a mix of my grandparents' names, James and, and Marie. And these events, when I think about it, were really like carnivals uh, where there were like hay rides and games and music and food and line dancing and fishing expeditions and awards to whoever won the egg toss and awards to whoever won the balloon tosses. Um, and I call it a carnival because I'd say only about a quarter of the 200 or so people that would attend the reunions every second Saturday of every July of every summer for about 12 years were family. Only a quarter were family. Everyone else were friends of the family as Sam spoke about they were our community and, and those who took care of our, our grandparents when all seven of my grandparents' children, my uncle and, and aunts lived outside of the immediate area. In the latter years, this, these jammery carnivals events, uh, my parents and aunts would also hold a granny camp. They, they tacked on a granny camp uh, to this event. And that's when all the kids of the family would hang out at the farm for a few days before the jammery. They were supervised lightly, but the key was they were without their parents and they, they loved it. And they'd fish and run around and be free and bond with their grandparents, just as my cousins and I did when we were, when we were their age. Um, my grandparents used our land, two specific plots at the time to help put their children, again, my uncles and aunt and my, my father through school. And as my grandparents got older and less agile, their children and my father and his siblings would send money back to the farm to ensure the taxes would be paid and the land remained uh, maintained. As I entered adulthood, um, we still have these jammeries um, and they remain quite special to all those who can and, and, and still attend. Um, and while these events remain magical to me as I've matured, however, I've become more interested and enamored with our land's history. And I realized in my adulthood, uh, the gravity of my family and my ancestors acquiring and maintaining and passing down this land to the family. I just, I, I realized how big of a deal it was and, and how big of a deal it still is. Uh, it was my dad's great grandfather in 1892 who purchased the initial plot of our land. A second adjacent plot was purchased, was purchased in the 1970s. Um, my grandmother in 2003, one of the last things she said to my father before she passed was she mentioned this other piece of land where her mother was buried. And she asked my father not to let anyone take ownership of that land, to go get that land. After all, you know, as she said, it was where her mother was buried. So it took my father and his siblings over 13 years to work through these air property issues, similar to Sam's story. And there was over 200 descendants of, of this particular plot of land that gran my grandmother spoke of. Um, but eventually, and with support and determination, it became legally um, our families and now our, our third plot of land. In the past 10 years, I've become involved and very close to Ebony Alexander of the Black Family Land Trust. And through her affiliation with SFLR, I think I saw her as one of the, the network uh, leads, um, anchor sites for SFLR. And my personal objective is to find USDA programs uh, that are applicable for our, our land and our community of landowners that we can leverage. And I'm sure I'm not alone when you talk to minority landowners in that, in that, in that effort. 
Um, through USDA, my family has funded forest management plans for all three plots. We've also obtained a grant to purchase and install a high tunnel. We grow and harvest loblolly pine on our land. So through SFLR, we've leveraged USDA programs to assist us with reseeding. And I, I've personally become involved with the American, uh, the American Forest Foundation. And as a board, I've helped AFF with diversity at their programmatic level, uh, essentially ensuring their initiatives, whether it's the Family Forest Carbon Program, which we'll hear more about, or the White Oak Initiative or the General Forest Management, I, I assist with minority land engagement and impact. And my family is also currently partnering in the early stages with a biotech startup firm uh, where we uh, grow hemp for fiber research and design and production, production purposes. Uh, so when asked about my family's story, and what our land means to me, the words, you know, magical and legacy and, and, and family and accessibility and lineage and finances, those all things, they, they all come to mind. And as I get older, the beautiful, you know, memories and smells and emotions, as I've mentioned, are still very present when I visit our farm. Uh, but what's equally at the forefront and what's top of mind is how am I going to keep this, this land in the family? Um, how do I keep our land intact? In as my father gets older, he's passing down and is currently passing down his ownership and his lessons learned in the business of the farm, his portion to my brothers and I. So, so now more than ever, I'm, I'm more concerned with how, how do we position the land at minimum to pay for itself and so that it's safely maintained and kept in the fam family for generations and, and we don't have to worry about who can afford what in terms of maintaining, maintaining the land. Um, I think before I knew what love meant, you know, as a child, I, I loved our land and I, it has defined who I am and it's shaped who I've become as, as an adult. There's no question about that. And it's much more than trees and dirts and coordinates on a map. It's truly our, our history and it's my history and it's designed uh, my family's construct, both literally and, and figuratively. figuratively. Um, and it's in essence, this legacy that was passed to me, and that's the one that I will pass down with pride to, to generations to come. So thanks for listening to my story. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> that was wonderful, Kendra. Um, I, I have some of the same thoughts and memories and, and all of that kind of stuff with my own farm. Um, and I appreciate you talking about, um, you know, the American Forest Foundation, um, because that will be our next speaker, Arjun. So Arjun is the Director of Product Development at American Forest Foundation. Um, it leads the innovation, development of just a range of, of products um, that can harness the potential of carbon markets for, for reforestation and afforestation, um, particularly across the U.S. Southeast. Um, before that, he uh, has done a number of stuff in business, uh, in sustainable health, wellness, food space, particularly in India. Um, and he had a former role as Associate Director of Partnership Management at Ashoka. So Arjun, I see you're here. If you want to uh, talk a little bit about your program with AFF or uh, whatever you feel called to talk about, um, I invite you to do so. Good morning. Uh, my name is Arjun Durr. I am the Director of Product Development at the American Forest Foundation. Uh, my team and I uh, study and use uh, carbon markets, particularly carbon credits, uh, to fund and support reforestation work across the U.S. with a particular focus on the U.S. Southeast. Uh, today, I'm going to explain a little bit about what a carbon credit is, um, what is a high-quality carbon credit, um, and what does our reforestation program look like? What kind of uh, what kind of deliveries do we have uh, for landowners? Um, and uh, then I'll explain a little bit more about um, our pasture land reforestation program. Okay, so uh, we're going to start with um, what is a carbon credit, and why do we create one? So we all have probably at some point heard of the carbon cycle, the flow of carbon from the atmosphere into the earth, the ocean, life on earth, and back into the atmosphere through things like photosynthesis and respiration. We all also might be familiar with the general idea behind climate change, that more carbon and other greenhouse gases are being emitted to the atmosphere than historical fluctuations due to human activities. 
these extra greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, both the amount of them and the increased length of time they stay there, mean more energy in the atmosphere, and more energy means more warming of, warming of the Earth. So basically, as countries and people have become more aware of the way greenhouse gases impact climate change, a market has emerged in which countries, companies, individuals, and other entities are compelled to purchase and sell units of greenhouse gas mitigation to help support the reduction and removal of human-caused greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. These entities may be motivated by new legal requirements imposed by their jurisdictions to reduce emissions, wanting to improve their reputation among competitors and consumers who care about climate change, and caring about mitigating climate change themselves, among other reasons. So these units can go by many names that are all slightly nuanced for different reasons and for different purposes and different audiences. A common term is a carbon credit. This refers to one metric ton of carbon dioxide that has been either avoided from being emitted into the atmosphere, uh, basically emission reduction, or has been removed from the atmosphere, which is what we do. Um, and this is compared to the relevant baseline. There are other types of climate mitigation units in the carbon market, such as in supply chain mitigation, sometimes called value chain mitigation, or scope three. Today, we're going to talk about uh, carbon credits. There are many types of activities that can generate carbon credits, one of which we'll be focusing on, which is natural climate solutions or the climate mitigation that natural processes can provide to us if we nurture them. Forestry is an entire subset of natural clean climate solutions that, we'll, that we will focus on. Um, so here you can see in the, in the presentation, um, you've got the baseline scenario you've got the carbon dioxide being captured um, by the trees and emitting oxygen back into the atmosphere. The emission reduction is basically when you have a critical mass of trees that's sequestering that carbon dioxide and that's removing that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now, there's a big question and discussion around what makes a carbon credit high quality. Carbon credits in the carbon market have come under a lot of criticism for whether it is actually making a real difference in the atmosphere. And there are two sides to this criticism, quality of supply and quality of demand. A high quality carbon credit is where high quality supply meets high quality demand. High quality demand occurs when the buyer of the carbon credit is purchasing it as part of a larger sustainability plan in which it has first assessed and address emissions in its own operations and supply chains to avoid, minimize, rectify, and reduce them, and then purchases carbon credits to address and finance the generation of carbon credits outside its operations to address, to address its residual emissions. High quality supply occurs when the supplier of the carbon credit ensures the credit representing is, is real and it has a lasting impact on the atmosphere. This can be determined by how transparently and completely and conservatively the supplier has addressed additionality, permanence, leakage, double counting, monitoring, and other issues that tend to come up. Scientific consensus around how these are best ensured exists, but it's still evolving as we learn more about how different carbon credit generating activities interact with other global processes. So, you see many different terms on this slide. Additionality is basically an activity that was not already legally required by law. And the land protected from, for example, the land protected from wildfire was actually at risk of wildfire. Permanence is when a forest avoided harvest for one year, but does, but does an extra large harvest the next year. When this is not a permanent solution. An example of leakage is when the elimination of a harvest from one property causes the harvesting of a neighboring property. Um, because at the end of the day, sawmills still have to meet demand. Um, by avoiding double counting, 
this is the same ton of carbon dioxide is not counted by multiple companies as part of addressing their residual emissions. Robustly monitored. What that means is the measurements, data, and procedures used to monitor the, char the changes in greenhouse gases as a result of the activity are robust. Third party validated and verified basically means the procedures, measurements, baseline, and activity are reported to and validated and verified by an independent third party, not the supplier or the buyer, that they conform to recognized standards that address these issues and that it does no harm and promotes sustainable development. That basically means the generation of the carbon credit does not create harm elsewhere in the local community and promotes other sustainable community development where pos where, where, wherever possible. And it contributes to a just and equitable transition. This is where the Family Forest Carbon Program, which is one of AFF's main, main programs uh, come, come in. So basically, American Forest Foundation and the Nature Conservancy have partnered together to create this program, which is designed for family forest owners to take part in the carbon market and engage in carbon credit generating activities on their land. In this program, landowners receive financial incentives and forestry expertise, and they get to focus on managing their woods, while our program manages the monitoring and verification of the credits generated. The activities offered by the program are also designed to improve the value of the timber on the land over time, providing the landowner with financial incentives in the near term from carbon and potential for timber sales in the future that could be done more sustainably than before being a part of the Family Forest Carbon Program. For example, there would be more trees available to harvest without selectively harvesting only the biggest and tallest trees. This is known as high grading which degrades woods and their carbon storage potential. The program is built to be financially sustainable through production and sale of carbon credits and other climate, claim, other climate claims. Traditionally, carbon markets have not been accessible to smaller family landowners due to high entry costs for things like forest inventories and monitoring and verification. The Family Forest Carbon Program handles this on behalf of the landowner through a group landscape level accounting approach taking on all the costs and risks to the landowner and, can, and they can focus on managing their woods. The landowner gives the program rights to sell the carbon and access the property for monitoring and commits to a certain management practice, such as reducing high grading or tree planting. We've also developed and validated a new methodology through one of the standard bodies, VERA, and their verified carbon standard. This methodology has an especially robust additionality approach in which both the project and the baseline are measured, monitored, and reported before and after initiation of the project. Typically, baselines for forest carbon pro projects have been modeled and based on things like business as usual assumptions. We developed a methodology in which nationally available forest inventory and analysis data from the US Forest Service, which is continuously monitored, is used as that baseline so that real in-ground forest monitoring plots are matched to our FSCP project areas of relevant or similar conditions. And the growth between the two is monitored over time to see what the impact of the intervention of the Family Forest Carbon, Family forest carbon Program project was. Okay, so now we're gonna move to uh, one of our newer products that we're developing. Um, uh, and this is this is the pastureland reforestation program. So basically, um, we're looking at different land types that uh, have a lot of potential for for reforestation projects. Um, this information is taken from Reforestation Hub, which is a really cool resource to see the potential within this country. Um, so basically, there are up to 133 million acres of opportunity to restore forest cover, of which 65 million is pastureland. Over 90% of this is privately owned. Um, within this, there is quite a significant portion of degraded pasture land. Um, for example, there are many reasons why it could be degraded. Climate change is a big one. Another is 
rising fertilizer costs have made this land uh, not usable uh, for people who used to maintain it. Uh, so we, we are basically assessing how much a carbon credit could that, you know, if we plant the trees, they capture the carbon on this land, how does that, how does that compare to what is being made or lost on this land already? Our area of focus is the Piedmont and lower coastal plain regions of Georgia, Alabama, and South Carolina. We also are looking at Florida as well. And the main types of pasture land are degraded grazing pasture and hayland production. Um, so basically, to get into a little more detail, um, this land is, a lot of the land is ideal for loblolly and longleaf, which opens up a variety of revenue streams. So it's not only carbon, but it's also timber, pine straw, pulp and paper, and even pine wood pellets. On the southern and southeastern coastal plains, woodland values are enhanced by grazing open stands of pine almost year round. This opens up an opportunity for civil pasture. These systems can increase productivity and resource use efficiencies and pasture systems and improve the value of timber stands in degraded and unmanaged woodlands as well. Um, our big focus here, our top priority as we develop this product is engaging landowners between this 50 to 450 acre range of pasture land. And we're trying to understand a little bit more about why they would want to convert it, um, their feelings about this space, about carbon, about timber. Um, and I have been gathering insights through forestry and cattle associations, but the big one is just different landowner networks, especially smallholder landowners. Um, and the biggest uh, focus within that are minority landowners. How can a carbon program combined with a timber stand um, help with land retention, which is a huge issue in the South? Um, so if you would like to learn more, please reach out to me. My contact details um, are, are in the program, uh, pro in, in the program explanation. Um, and uh, next year, at the end of uh, next year, we're going to be in Georgia, Alabama, and Florida launching a pilot, uh, a reforestation pilot as well. Um, thank you all for your time. Um, and uh, yeah, take care.